Homelands is the seventh expansion release from Magic the Gathering, and to this day remains one of the worst sets ever released. Not only are there not many interesting or fun cards in the set, there are few to no good cards in the set. Every creature is understated, every spell weak and unimpactful. However, we're only trying to go over the absolute bottom of the barrel from this already bottom of the barrel set. Starting us off at number 10, we have Dwarven Sea Clan. This is a 1-1 dwarf with a mana cost of 2 and 1 red. It has the ability where you can tap it to choose an attacking or blocking creature whose owner controls an island. It deals 2 damage to that creature at the end of combat, and you can only activate this ability before the end of combat. For some reason, Wizards was obsessed with cards that only work if your opponent has very specific types of lands in the early days of the game. This was mostly being done for flavor reasons, but that doesn't stop it from being a very difficult mechanic to work around. The fact is, you just won't be able to use Sea Clan's ability very often, especially since if you can use it, it's because your opponent lets you. If your opponent does control an island, they can just not attack so long as Sea Clan is up. It's very easy to play around this ability. Now, the fact that an ability can be played around doesn't automatically make it bad. After all, if you can force your opponent to not attack, that's still a type of value. Of course, this is assuming your opponent has a creature that having 2 damage dealt to after combat would be an issue, and that they don't have a removal spell for C-Clan, and assuming they have an island in the first place. The stacking of all of these requirements makes it difficult to ever actually use C-Clan's ability, so you're often left with a 3-mana 1-1, a putrid rate. The only creatures at the stat line that have seen play are creatures like Goblin Matron, who are mostly instants and sorceries stapled onto a body. The only value you're getting off of clan is its activated ability. You'll have to hide it in your sideboard for a game 2 against blue decks that have creatures with toughness 2 or less, which is an incredible minority of decks. You have to ask why you're not playing a card like Pyroclasm instead that's useful in far more situations. Pyroclasm was even printed in Ice Age, the set printed immediately before this one, so players did have access to this far more power removal spell. C-Clan can, on some board states, be useful, which is more than can be said for a lot of the cards on this list, but it's so inconsistent that you're essentially gambling in the card even doing anything. And at number 9, we have Clockwork Swarm. This is a 0-3 insect artifact creature with a mana cost of 4. It has the ability where it enters the battlefield with 4 plus 1 plus 0 counters on it. It can't be blocked by walls, and at the end of combat, if the swarm attacked or blocked in this combat, you remove a plus 1 plus 0 counter from it. You can also pay X and tap it to put X plus 1 plus 0 counters on Clockwork Swarm, but you can't use this to make the total number of counters on Swarm over 4, and you can only activate this ability during your upkeep. This card just screams early magic design. It's overly complicated for an effect that doesn't actually change the way the card plays very much, and it also features a very unique type of counter. The only stat changing counters we usually see are plus one plus one counters, and sometimes minus one minus one counters. Though, in the early days, they did use other types of stat changing counters as well. One of the downsides of using these kinds of counters is you can't use this card alongside cards like Hardened Scales or Abzan Falconer that normally work with plus one plus one counters, now that you'd want to if you could. Even if Swarm didn't have to deal with the whole losing and regaining counters mechanic, it wouldn't really be good. A 4 mana 4 3 with a very niche upside wouldn't have seen all that much play, even back in the day. Creatures were a lot worse back then, but most colors still had better threats for around as much mana. However, it does have these abilities, and they're a huge burden on the card. The card will quickly become a hill giant stat line, which was never really playable, and then only get worse and worse each turn. The ability to get these counters back is far too punishing as well. Forcing you to tap the creature, and during your upkeep no less, means you'll have to take off attacking or blocking for an entire turn to get some of your power back. You'll also have to use a whole bunch of your mana, making it harder for you to get anything else done that turn. Usually, you'll have to give up doing anything with most of your mana and the creature itself for a turn to make it larger again. Giving up that much time for a card that's just a beater just isn't worth it. Now, there were quite a few creatures that could have made it into this list. Ebony Rhino almost made it into this list, but it's just a bad stat line all the time, as opposed to a card that fluctuates between being bad and unplayable. There's also Clockwork Steed, which is almost as bad, except it can't be blocked by any other artifact creatures which is at least an upside that will come up sometimes as opposed to not being able to be blocked by one very specific uncommon creature type. And at number 8, we have Leeches. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 1 and 2 white. It is the effect where target player loses all poison counters, then Leeches deals that much damage to that player. Poison, for anyone who may not know, is a mechanic where if you get 10 poison counters, you lose the game, and there are various ways to gain poison counters. Leeches is a pretty well-known card, at least amongst a certain segment of the player base. Leeches is the only card in all of Magic that removes poison counters from a player. The only other way to get rid of them is with Karn Liberated, who has the ability to restart the entire game, and restarting the game will reset you back to zero poison counters. Despite this, it's also pretty terrible. The main issue is that poison counters are one of the most niche win conditions in all of Magic. 
There are a few Infect decks running around Modern and Legacy, but leeches won't actually help you against these decks. Anyone who's played an Infect deck or played against them will tell you you don't usually get a chance to cast a card like leeches to save yourself. The way most Infect decks will win is by using a number of pump spells on a single, cheap Infect creature. Often you'll go from 0 to 10 Infect in a single turn and with their best hands far before turn 3. Not only will you often be dead before you can even cast leeches, but in Legacy, the only format where leeches is legal and Infect is a playable deck, Infect decks often play cards like Force of Will, a 0 mana counterspell. So even if you do live, they can have counterspell to stop your leeches from going through. It's also worth mentioning that leeches was printed way before any of the actual Infect mechanics were printed. The main way players get poison counters nowadays are from Infect and Toxic, neither of which existed at the time. Instead, all the poison counters were coming from cards like Marsh Viper, which weren't exactly stellar threats. Leeches was far too niche to ever be useful, and even when it did come up, it just didn't do its job very well. And at number 7, we have Coral Reef. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 2 blue. It is the ability where Coral Reef enters the battlefield with 4 poor lip counters on it. You can sacrifice an island to put two pull-up counters on Coral Reef, and you can pay one blue, tap and untap a blue creature you control, and remove a pull-up counter from Coral Reef to get a plus zero plus one counter on target creature. Coral Reef is a card that's only purpose is to increase the toughness of your creatures, which right away is a really big problem. Toughness boosting effects just aren't that good in general, as they don't do anything proactive. When you boost your creatures, you basically always want some extra attacking power as well. Boosting toughness can give you more good attacks that you normally wouldn't be able to risk, but that's very niche. Overall, it's just far too difficult to get value out of the effect without some other cards to make it more powerful. Of course, this is ignoring the other issues with the card, namely that the process of getting those toughness boosts out is a huge bother as well. Having to tap a blue creature you control makes it a lot more cumbersome to make use of. You can at least do this at instant speed, so you can tap your creatures at the end of your opponent's turn or after blocks. This way, you at least won't necessarily have to skip out on using it for an entire turn. Still, it does prevent you from using it to put out counters on creatures before attacking anywhere near as easily, as you'll have to give up on using the creatures you tap as attackers or blockers for the turn cycle. The ability to put extra counters on Reef is also pretty bad, as sacrificing lands is always a huge cost. Though you probably won't use the four counters it comes with anytime soon, so the fact that it's hard to put more counters in the card isn't as bad as it could be. Still, Coral Reef is a card that doesn't really accomplish much. It asks for quite a bit of mana up front and only gives you a very small benefit, and that benefit, for some reason, asks for you to meet even more requirements to get. And at number 6, we have Ace and Highway. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 3 and 3 white. It is the effect where all white creatures have Planeswalk. This is an ability that makes it so as long as the defending player controls the planes, the creature can't be blocked. Landwalk abilities are very feast or famine in terms of use. Unlike abilities like Menace, which makes it so that creatures can only be blocked by two or more creatures, it's not something that will matter against all decks. Instead, it will only matter against very specific decks and not at all at any other time. It's certainly not a bad ability, but it can be a bit difficult to design for. Highway shows the pitfalls of this design pretty well. You see, if Highway is used, it's because your opponent is playing a white deck. And if they're on white, they'll most likely have white creatures. And since you also need to have three white mana to cast Highway, you'll probably have planes, meaning you won't be able to block any of your opponent's creatures. Highway basically always goes both ways. However, if you play the card, well, you're the one paying for it. You're using an entire card in your hand on top of six mana to give your board evasion, which is already a really steep cost. This makes Ace and Highway one of the worst means by which you can try to improve your board in white. White already has access to cards like Glorious Anthem, which pump your entire board. While this doesn't give your creatures evasion, making your board bigger makes blocks more difficult for your opponent and critically actually increases your damage output. Now, there is actually a situation where the card can be useful. If you already have a lot of creatures on board and getting them all through unblocked would be unable to deal lethal damage, you can play Highway and push for game right there. While this can be useful at points, it's overall just not worth it. Costing 6 mana is enough to make the card kind of bad on its own, even if it didn't also help your opponent. Even at 3 mana, the card would only see a tiny amount of play because against most opponents, it just wouldn't do anything at all. Costing as much as cards like True Conviction really just shows how hard the card is to use. And at number 5, we have Anhava Township. This is a land with no land types and the abilities where you can tap it for colorless mana. Pay 1 and tap it to add a green mana, or pay 2 and tap it to add a red or white mana. This card is a member of a cycle of lands that all have these sets of abilities at the same cost, but for different combinations of colors. These are maybe some of the worst color fixing lands we've ever seen printed. It's worth comparing to cards like Unknown Shores, a land with the ability to tap for colorless and lets you pay 1 and tap it to add a mana of any color. 
Shores has never really been that great of a card, only seen play in very, very specific circumstances. It's mostly played in limited as a way to let you splash extra colors. The issue is that you're going down a full mana to filter, so you're giving up a lot in tempo. Players usually opt to deal with the downsides of other color fixing lands rather than play Shores. This has basically always been true, and these filter lands are even less useful. Not only are they able to filter for three colors of mana, but they ask for an extra mana for two of those colors. Activating the ability to pay two mana to filter is absolutely awful. At that point, you're basically paying three mana for one mana of a certain color, something that will put you so behind your opponent in terms of tempo. Not to mention that these lands can't even give you access to all five colors of mana by themselves. This is made even worse by the fact that there were just better mana fixing lands available at the time. City of Brass is a great five color land whose downside makes you deal one damage to you whenever it becomes tapped, and while a notable downside, still makes it far better than Township and City of Brass was printed in the very first expansion of Magic, Arabian Nights. It's all in all one of the worst cycles of mana fixing lands Wizards has ever rolled out. And at number 4, we have Renewal. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 2 and 1 green. It has an additional cost to cast a spell, where you sacrifice a land. You search your library for a basic land card and put it in the battlefield, and then shuffle. You also draw a card at the beginning of your next turn's upkeep. This may look like a ramp spell, but it's actually not. Actual ramp spells like Hero result in you having more lands on the field than you started with, whereas Renewal ends with you having access to the same number of lands as before. Instead, it's merely a color fixing card, and as such, is basically useless. Players very rarely play spells that do nothing other than fix their colors, as they usually just rely on their lands to do that for them. The few spells that do have color fixing effects that I've seen play do a lot more than Renewal does. For example, Prismatic Omen, for 2 mana, gives all of your lands all basic land types, letting them cast for any color of mana. This not only completely fixes your colors, but it also gives you access to land type synergies, which has mattered a lot for Valakut, the Molten Pinnacle decks. All Renewal does is let you trade one land in for another land in your deck for 3 mana. Wizards seems to have taken this into account, and has started designing cards with similar facts that are far more efficient. For example, cards like Ash Barons, which has seen play in Pomper, lets you pay 1 mana to discard it and find a basic land card from your deck and put it into your hand. You can also do this at instant speed, unlike Renewal, and you can simply play it from your hand to tap it for colorless mana at a pinch if you can't afford to spend time to cycle it. This makes it, in a lot of ways, a strict upgrade to Renewal. This mostly just goes to show how much better Wizards can and has made color fixing cards without breaking anything. The only real use for Renewal is a way to get more landfall triggers. These are abilities that trigger whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, and since Renewal puts a land right into play, it does give you an additional landfall trigger. However, there are cards that can and have been used in the same role far more effectively. We already mentioned Harrow, a card that puts two lands into play for just three mana. Just about any rampant growth effect will overall be better with landfall thanks to actually ramping you, as the card draw of a renewal just isn't as good as getting access to extra mana. Still, this small use case is enough to keep renewal from being higher on this list, as it can technically be used to do something worthwhile. Sometimes, it's just outclassed in that role. And at number three, we have Winter Sky. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of one red. It has the effect where you can flip a coin, and if you win the flip, it deals 1 damage to each creature and each player. If you lose the flip, each player draws a card. Cards involving randomness are, more often than not, too unreliable for competitive play. Even cards with very powerful effects attached to random ability have just not been worth using in a tournament. For some reason, Winter Sky decided it needed to combine a really weak ability and an actively bad ability, slap some randomness on them, and call it a day. Dealing 1 damage to everything is a very situational effect. There are board states where your opponent has a lot of 1 toughness creatures in play, and dealing 1 to everything can blow them out. This is why cards like In the Festivities have seen play in sideboards in formats like Legacy deciding against decks that play a ton of 1 toughness threats. Winter Sky could be used in this way as well, but it's generally just worse at the job, as it also deals damage to your entire board at the same time. That's assuming you get that effect, of course. The effect to make both players draw a card is more than likely to lose you the game than anything else. Your opponent is getting all the same upsides without paying anything, meaning if you flip wrong, you've gotten nothing for your trouble. You can try to make this effect better by playing cards like Ebony and Al Netsuke that punish your opponent for drawing cards, but then you fall into the same trap as the other half of the effect. If you flip the other effect and you're trying to fill your opponent's hand, you won't accomplish anything. Putting two very situational and weak effects on a random effect, you end up with a card that's just never worth casting. And at number two, we have Joven's Tools. This is an artifact with a mana cost of six. It is the ability where you can pay 4 and tap it to make it so the target creature can't be blocked this turn except by walls. 
So, for a total of 10 mana, you get to hit your opponent with one of your creatures a single time without them being able to block. It should go without saying that that's just not worth the mana. Most of the time, you'd be better off just casting another threat and making it more difficult for your opponent to block that way. It's very difficult to even talk about why this card is so bad, mostly because it's very obvious. The mana costs, both on the card and activating the ability, are just ludicrously high for seemingly no reason. One of the things that hurts the most about Joven's tools is having it rotting in your hand for several turns before you can even play the card. For 6 mana, you usually need a game-ending card to justify paying the price, or at least one that has an immediate impact on the game. Even after you pay 6 mana, it asks you to pay more mana to actually impact the game. Exactly where the right price for this kind of effect is, is a bit hard to place, but at this point, we have cards that can do this at a much better rate. Rogue's Passage is a land that lets you pay 4 mana and tap it to make a creature unable to be blocked until the end of turn. Technically, this actually costs more mana to activate than Tools does. However, it doesn't cost you anything to get into play. You just have to play it as a land for turn. There are tons of cards like this that are just better than Tools is, at least nowadays. This is probably another area where Wizards printed a card, saw how bad it was, and then powercraft the effect over time until it was actually at a usable level. That doesn't save it from being a horrible card, though. Tools is a failed experiment, a sacrifice on the road to Wizards and the players understanding how much you should and shouldn't pay for certain effects. And at number 1, we have Prophecy. This is a sorcerer with a mana cost of 1 white. It has the effect we reveal the top card of target opponent's library. If it's a land card, you gain 1 life. Then, that player shuffles. At the beginning of the next turn's upkeep, you draw a card. So for the price of 1 white mana, you have around a 33% chance to gain 1 life, and you get to draw a card in a full turn. Paying 1 mana to gain a life on a non-repeatable card would basically never be worth it, unless the card has a different effect that was actually good on top of gaining life. This is sort of similar to Winter Sky, where the card has a not good effect locked behind randomness, seemingly just because the designers of Homelands hated the player. <laughs> now, it's hard to think of a use case for Prophecy that another card doesn't do better. The only real way to take advantage of the card is with cards that trigger when you gain life. While this is the best way to make use of the card, it's still very bad. Not only are cards like Ajani's Welcome better for fulfilling this purpose, but even on its own, Prophecy is horrible. Again, it only has a 1 in 3 chance of even doing anything. You have to cast other cards and make the cards a random chance of doing something something actually worth doing, which is probably even worse than it sounds in practice. The best use for this card is probably to force your opponent to shuffle after they use a card like Vampiric Tutor or Brainstorm to stack the top of their deck. That way, you can stop them from drawing the card they were wanting to. Of course, there's still an issue. Not only is it outclassed by other cards, it also wouldn't really work because these cards are instants and Prophecy is a sorcery. Usually, these spells are cast at the end of turn right before the opponent untaps. This means you won't actually have the ability to disrupt their plays with Prophecy at all meaning that the card has lost another use case it could have had. With both of these niches suitably dismantled, Prophecy has nothing to do. With no place where it could even theoretically be good, Prophecy is pretty solidly the worst card in the entire set, and a front runner for the worst card in Magic. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any cards you think we may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, let us know down in the comments below.